Now we move to the keynote address. Um, Senator George Mitchell is a great friend to many in this room, a great friend to our peace process, and of course, um, a very great friend to this university. He's a former chancellor of Queen's University between 1999 and 2009, and was appointed as the inaugural United States Special Envoy for Northern Ireland by President Bill Clinton back in 1995. He was, of course, chair of the all-party talks that led to the signing of the agreement. And in 2016, as you heard earlier from Professor Donnan, Queen's University launched the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Senator George Mitchell. Thank you. Secretary of State, Tanishta, Taoiseach Bertie Ahern, Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. The powerful video we just watched sets the tone for this afternoon's event. I'm honored to open these proceedings to welcome so many of the key figures in the peace process to this ceremony, marking the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, also known as the Belfast Agreement. I reiterate Professor Donnan's welcome to our chairs and panelists and to all of you in the audience today. History will look back on this day as a reflection of how far we've come in Northern Ireland and how much further we still have to travel. It's fitting that this event is taking place at Queen's, a world-leading international university focused on the needs of the society, a university I was very proud to serve as chancellor. I'm also honored to be associated with the institute which organized today's event. It seeks to address the global challenge of building a peaceful, secure, and inclusive world. 20 years ago, the government of the United Kingdom, the government of Ireland, and eight Northern Ireland political parties declared their support for the agreement that we celebrate today. In the current political climate of Northern Ireland, I think it useful for all of us to recall and to heed the powerful and moving words by which the governments and the parties pledged their support for the agreement. And I quote briefly from their declaration. The tragedies of the past have left a deep and profoundly regrettable legacy of suffering. We must never forget those who have died or been injured and their families, but we can best honor them through a fresh start in which we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance, and mutual trust and to the protection and vindication of the human rights of all. We are committed to partnership, equality, and mutual respect as the basis of relationships within Northern Ireland, between North and South, and between these islands. We affirm our total and absolute commitment to exclusively democratic and peaceful means of resolving differences on political issues, and our opposition to any use or threat of force by others for any political purpose, whether in regard to this agreement or otherwise. When I announced the agreement, 
I described it as an historic achievement, and it was. But I also said on that day that by itself the agreement did not guarantee peace or political stability or reconciliation. It made them possible. But achieving and sustaining those lofty goals would require of future leaders the vision and courage that the leaders of Northern Ireland in 1998 demonstrated. I hope that the current leaders of Northern Ireland, of Ireland, of the United Kingdom, and of the European Union, as they today reflect on their responsibilities, will look back 20 years to what their predecessors did. Much has been said and written about the long and difficult road that led to the agreement. Many have deservedly received credit for their roles, and many of them are here today. Prime Minister Tony Blair and his predecessor, John Major. Prime Minister Bertie Ahern and his predecessors, Albert Reynolds and John Bruton. They and their governments laid the foundation for the negotiations, and then they brought those negotiations to a successful conclusion. Both prime ministers were ably supported by a talented and dedicated corps of civil servants whose work has not been adequately recognized. President Bill Clinton was the first American president to make peace in Northern Ireland a central objective of his administration. He and Mrs. Clinton were deeply concerned about the adverse effect of continued conflict, and they became deeply involved in and personally concerned about the lives of the people who live on this island. But the real heroes of the agreement were the people of Northern Ireland and their political leaders. The people supported the effort to achieve agreement and afterward, they voted overwhelmingly to ratify it. Their political leaders, in dangerous and difficult circumstances, after lifetimes devoted to conflict, summoned extraordinary courage and vision and reached agreement, often at great risk to themselves, their families, and their political careers. Today, across the Western world, it's fashionable to demean and to insult political leaders. And certainly, much of it is deserved. But we don't pay enough attention or tribute to those political leaders who do dare greatly and succeed. In Northern Ireland, these were ordinary men and women. But after 700 days of failure, they joined in one day of success, and they changed the course of history. Many of them are here today, and I ask them to stand, and I ask all of you to join me in recognizing and applauding them, the heroes and the peacemakers of Northern Ireland. Would you please stand, those of you who are involved in that process. I return to Northern Ireland often because I love this place and the people here. They're energetic, they're productive, they're always a pleasure to be with. Now it's true they can be argumentative and quick to take offense. As the late David Irvine, a great man and a good friend, loudly said to me on the very first day of negotiations, Senator, he said, if you are to be any, of any use to us, there's one thing you must understand. When I asked what it was, he replied, we in Northern Ireland would drive 100 miles out of our way 
to receive an insult. <laughs> well, he was right, but nobody's perfect. The current problems in Northern Ireland are difficult, and they're serious, and they must be resolved. But at the same time, we should not hold Northern Ireland to a higher standard than applied to everyone else in the world. Every society, including my own country of the United States, the United Kingdom and Ireland, has social and political problems. What we must do now is not to despair, not to look backward, but to reaffirm to the people and the leaders of Northern Ireland our dedication to the principle that the political differences here and elsewhere must be resolved through democratic and peaceful means, not through the use or threat of violence. We must reaffirm our continuing involvement, our strong and unwavering encouragement and support, our trade, our tourism, all as tangible evidence of our deep devotion to the cause of peace and prosperity in Northern Ireland. The UK government and the European Union have publicly committed themselves to a Brexit outcome that does not reestablish a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. We welcome and accept and support and insist on that outcome. And the governments of both And the governments of both the U.S. and the U.K. must avoid any political or economic decision that costs jobs or create hardship in Northern Ireland. My service in Northern Ireland changed my life, and so I want to close with some very personal comments. My father's parents were born in Ireland but they became part of the great migration of billions who crossed the Atlantic Ocean in search of opportunity in the free world. Many succeeded, many did not. My father never knew his parents. His mother died early, his father couldn't care for their children, and so he was raised in an orphanage. After several years, he was adopted by an elderly, childless couple who were not Irish and who lived in a small town in the state of Maine. My father had little schooling. He led a long, hard life as a laborer and ended up as a janitor at a local school. My mother was an immigrant from Lebanon. She could not read or write. And for 50 years, she worked a night shift in textile mills. My parents were very poor and died penniless. But in their minds, they were successful because each of their children got an education. And then thanks to the openness of American society, each has lived a life far beyond our parents' imagination. My father had no sense whatever of his heritage. I never heard him say the word Ireland. So when President Clinton asked me to come to Northern Ireland, I too lacked any sense of my heritage. But in the years since, I have come to know and love the people of Ireland, North and South. I've been blessed to make so many friends and to be so warmly received here. I like to think that my father is looking down from above pleased to see that his son has come to understand and enjoy his heritage as he never did or could. Many of you have thanked me for my work here. My response is that it is I who should be grateful, and I am, for you have filled an inner void that I didn't even know existed. I am an American and very proud of it, but a large part of my heart and of my emotions will forever be with the people of Northern Ireland. May God bless them with peace, with prosperity, 
and true reconciliation. We've got an incredible lineup of panelists and chairs, so I know you're all keen to hear this afternoon's discussion. We're all proud of how far we've come in the past 20 years. And while we still have a way to go, I hope the discussions will help in some way to reignite the will to work together for a peaceful and prosperous Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland today is unrecognizable to the Northern Ireland of two decades ago. A trip to the North Coast is met by busloads of tourists, and if it's not the tourists you're meeting on the road, then it's the vans of filmmakers at the dark hedges. I hope this afternoon's event reminds us of just how far we've come. And on that note, I hand back to Yvette to get the panel discussions underway. Thank you all very much for your presence and support. Beautifully set, of course, and not for the first time by Senator Mitchell. Um, I'm going to ask you please to thank all of our speakers this afternoon. Professor Hastings Donnan, the Secretary of State, Karen Bradley, Tonishta, Simon Coveney, and of course Senator Mitchell, from whom we will be hearing again later in proceedings. But please, another round of applause for our first guests. <laughs> <laughs>